And this podcast is on the idea of how do species actually evolve. So we've talked through natural selection about how variations within a population can change, whether it's you know having more white moths or dark colored moths or having more red beetles or blue beetles. And that's a shifting of those variations, the shifting of those alleles. But the question that we're going to address in this presentation is, when do we actually say we've evolved a new species? Okay, how do we make that um, transition from actually just different variations within the same species to saying this is a completely new species that has come about? So first of all, we need to talk about, well, what is a species? So I want you to write down this definition for yourself as to what is a species in your notebook. So a species is a group of organisms of interbreeding populations, and that's important. So population, remember, is a group of organisms of the same type, and what we're relying on here for a species is that they can breed with each other. Okay, That population has a unique genetic identity, meaning it's genetically different than other populations in the area. And it's reproductively isolated, which means it's only reproducing within its own species. It's not going out of the species to reproduce. Okay, so now that we've got the idea of what a species is, the question is how do we get to that point? So we're going to focus in on this reproductive isolation. How do we get these groups of organisms separated from each other? So. In reproductive isolation, there are two ways that can happen. We can have the prezygotic isolation or the postzygotic isolation. Now, what does that mean? That means that we could have different breeding populations separated from each other before fertilization occurs. So there are ways to separate um, different groups of organisms apart from each other before the egg and the sperm or whatever it is comes together. Or we could have postzygotic. Again, post is your identifier here, it means after fertilization. So maybe there's something preventing reproduction after fertilization has actually occurred. I'm going to give you examples of both of these, so hopefully these will make more sense as we go through. So just know that of our um, category for reproductive isolation, we have two types okay, prezygotic and postzygotic, both dependent upon when the fertilization actually occurs. So first we're going to go through the examples of prezygotic barriers. So things that keep populations apart, apart from breeding uh, before that egg and sperm actually comes together. So you need to write that as your heading. Number one is going to be habitat isolation. So number one, habitat isolation. This one is the easiest, I think, to understand. So different groups of organisms are isolated, they can't reproduce with each other if they live in different habitats. Okay, and the example they give you here is lions and tigers. So lions and tigers usually do not interbreed with each other. They could, um, and we'll talk more about that later, they can produce offspring, but in the wild, in nature, they don't because they live in different habitats. Okay, so they don't interbreed because they don't run into each other normally. They are separated or isolated from each other based on their actual location. All right, number two, temporal isolation. Temporal refers to time. Okay, in this case, we're looking at the timing of mating. Okay, so differences in the timing of mating prevent species from interbreeding. So maybe these species could interact and, and actually mate, but they mate at different times, so that never happens. The example down here are these different frog species. They live and breed in the same pond. They all live together in the same area, but they reproduce at different times of the year. You know, maybe one reproduces in the early spring, another in the late summer, and so their species never mix. Okay, their DNA never comes together because of that timing difference. Okay, number three, 
is behavioral isolation. And it is what it sounds like. It's due to behavior differences. So mating behaviors are very specific to certain species. And they need to have those particular mating behaviors uh, before mating actually takes place. So if those things like a courtship display, so for example, a fancy little dance that maybe a bird does to attract a mate or a song that it sings or a special um, vocalization that it makes that has to happen in order for mating to occur, then that's going to separate different populations that may or may not do that. Pheromones are special hormones released by organisms that signal to other organisms of the same type that they are ready to mate. Um, so lots of insects, for example, use pheromones to help attract other insects for mating. And then of course the one I just gave you an example of already was bird songs. Okay, singing a specific song is really important for certain male birds to attract mates. Again, if they're not of the same species and they're not going through these behaviors, then those organisms aren't going to mate because those behaviors aren't there. On to number four, called mechanical isolation. Okay, mechanical here, we're not, you know, talking about mechanics necessarily, you know, like your mechanic for your car. What we're talking about here is how the parts actually work together. Okay, so these are anatomical differences between the species make the mating physically impossible. Okay, so the shape of the genitals, for example, for those organisms don't fit together. The body size might prohibit that. I mean, think of, you know, something really small like a, a mouse trying to mate with an elephant. Okay, that's just crazy. So those are mechanical differences that prevent certain species from mating with each other. Okay, floral isolation It's going to be number five, I believe, we're on to here. Floral isolation obviously um, is referring to plants, flowers, and pollination systems can be different also as far as their you know, physical structure and how they actually work. So the example is two different species of columbine, that's what this flower is right over here, that's a columbine. They have different structures, so they're pollinated by different animals. So in that pollination, you know, we're transferring that pollen, which is a reproductive cell, back and forth between certain flowers. And if the flowers don't have the same structures for pollination, they're never going to swap pollen. Okay, so again, it's kind of like a mechanical isolation because it's the structure itself that's preventing it. But this one's specific to flowers and pollination. Okay, gametic isolation is how this one's pronounced. That's number six. Gametic refers to gametes. Remember, gametes are those sperm and egg cells. So the gametes cannot physically fuse together. You know, usually there's a, a male cell and a female cell that have to come together in sexual reproduction to make that combination of DNA happen. If they can't physically fuse together, that mating is never going to happen. And the example is the sea urchin. Okay, the sea urchin in the ocean, okay, they live in kind of the same area. They release all their gametes, their eggs and sperm into the water at approximately the same time. But just because of the physical uh, structure of these gametes, they can't fuse together unless it's of the same type. So the red sea urchin, which we see here, is going to have its gametes that only will actually fuse with other red sea urchin gametes. They can't physically combine with any others. So another thing that keeps them isolated. All right, so that's all of our prezygotic barriers. You notice again that all of those happened before fertilization actually took place. So they prevented, in other words, fertilization from happening, prevented the egg and the sperm from actually coming together. There are a few, though, that um, prevent species from um, combining that happen after that fertilization has taken place. So these are called postzygotic barriers. In these examples, the egg and the sperm has come together, 
um, most of the time to produce some sort of organism between two different species, but something happens that prevents those species from developing any further. So we're going to go into those next. First thing we got to do is a definition, and that is of a hybrid. Okay, so hybrids are the offspring of two genetically distinct parents. Okay, so we're talking about two species here. So, for example, here we've got our ligers. I told you I'd get back to this. Tigers and lions can actually reproduce. Um, they don't naturally in the wild, as I said, because they are separated uh, by habitat. But if they are in the same habitat, they will reproduce and form what's called a liger. And we call that a hybrid. Okay, you probably heard about hybrids in crops and other things as well. So in all these cases, we're going to be talking about hybrids. So when the gametes of two different species come together and form a hybrid, and then what happens then after that as far as um, halting that species formation? Okay, so our first example of postzygotic is hybrid inviability. Something is inviable, that means it cannot survive. Okay, so this is number one. So if something cannot survive as a hybrid, that means it's going to die. So the hybrid zygote, so the result of fertilization, does not develop into an adult. Okay, so we get that zygote form, that original fusing takes place, but the adult does not fully develop. So um, there are different types of frogs of the genus Rana. So Rana pipiens, for example, is our leopard frog that you guys see a lot around here with the spots on it. Um, it can form hybrid tadpoles with other Rana species like the bullfrog over here. Okay, so we could get a leopard frog and a bullfrog to form the tadpoles, but the tadpoles die before coming, becoming adults. So they are not viable. Number two is called hybrid sterility. Okay, if you have an organism that's sterile, that means it cannot have its own babies. All right, so the hybrids live, but they cannot produce viable gametes. Okay, so they can't make um, sperm or egg cells that actually can have new babies or that can produce new babies. So a common example of this that a lot of people are probably familiar with is mules. Mules are the offspring of a horse, that's a female, and a donkey, that's a male. And when we cross those, we get a mule, but we can't put two mules together and make another mule. Okay, they don't make eggs or sperm that actually can produce babies. So the only way to get a mule is from a horse and a donkey. You can't put two mules together to get a mule. Um, also, fruit flies, that's what this one is, Drosophila. Um, when we make Hybrids, the males are sterile, while the females are fertile. So again, a difference even there between the two sexes. So sterility meaning they cannot produce any new offspring. Hybrid breakdown. So number three. happens when there are offspring that are produced from hybrid, but the offspring can't produce more offspring, essentially. So here, the progeny, those are the babies, have reduced fitness. Okay, that means the offspring don't produce as many offspring. So the hybrids can have babies, and the babies grow into adults, but those adults can't have children, or don't have very many children. So the example they give here is this copepod, kind of a microscopic water-dwelling creature. Um, the hybrids can have offspring, okay, but those offspring says they have reduced potential for survival and or reproduction. So in other words, the hybrids do grow up, the babies grow up, but the second or third generation, the, the grandbabies, if you want to call them that, don't survive as well or don't reproduce as well.